It was 1949. A reporter from the International News Service asked the FBI for the names and descriptions of the toughest guys the Bureau would like to capture. The resulting story generated so much publicity and had so much appeal that FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover implemented a 10 Most Wanted Fugitives program the following year in March 1950. The first person to be placed on that list was Thomas James Holden, wanted for the murder of his wife, her brother, and her stepbrother. Since 1950, scores of fugitives have been added to the 10 most wanted fugitives list and hundreds have been apprehended or located, all thanks to the help of listeners like you and the media. And now in its 70th year, we're celebrating the anniversary of the top 10 list in this latest episode of Inside the FBI. I'm Steve Lewis. Inside the FBI is a show that highlights the Bureau's latest news, activities, and missions in audio form. You'll hear character-driven stories from some of our most intriguing cases, interviews from the field, and historical topics like the 70th anniversary of the 10 Most Wanted Fugitives list. So turn the volume up, sit back, and stay tuned. This is Inside the FBI. Maybe you've seen them on the news or on social media. Maybe you saw them years ago in a post office, or recently on a highway billboard. I'm talking about FBI Wanted posters, the Bureau's long-standing way of grabbing the public's attention about wanted fugitives accused of the most heinous crimes. Among the worst of those offenders, the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives. This is Eric Durazio with Inside the FBI. And today in this episode, we're highlighting the 70th anniversary of our 10 Most Wanted Fugitives program, commonly known as the Top 10 List. The FBI has been hunting fugitives since its earliest iteration in 1908. Going back over a century, the Bureau would issue flyers to law enforcement agencies and departments, notifying them of criminals we were looking for. These were called identification orders. As law enforcement outreach developed, the Bureau found that it could solicit public support through wanted posters and information on an offender provided to newspapers. What came next was engaging the media in this effort. To explain that, here's resident FBI historian Dr. John Fox. So by by the late 1940s, the uh, media was actually getting very interested in how they could publicized information about this. And a couple of of news services came to us, and eventually a reporter named William Hutchinson, who worked for the predecessor of UPI, said, you know, I'd like a list of the 10 people that you're most interested in catching. I'm going to do little profiles of them, and it's going to be a news feature that will go across the country. The seeds of the 10 Most Wanted Fugitives program were planted with the article that Mr. Hutchinson wrote. Published in February 1949, The news story became so popular with the public that the Bureau soon considered a program to regularly publicize the criminals in which they were most interested. A national campaign could generate public support to assist in the capture of these at-large offenders. Seizing this opportunity, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover implemented the 10 Most Wanted Fugitives list on March 14, 1950. This is your FBI! Once the 10 Most Wanted program kicked off, the FBI already had a number of different ways to get the information out to the public. This included local post offices, town halls, and other places that many people could see the information. The outreach didn't just stop with posting paper on concrete walls, however. Sometimes we might mention something, um, you know, on a news program or a radio program, that sort of thing. The newspapers certainly uh, did it as well. Most of our fugitive information went to fellow law enforcement. You know, there were only a, a number of cases or percentage of cases that we thought that the public would would be able to help us out. In them. Another thing I like to I like to mention, I, I think this is kind of interesting, but if you think about a wanted poster, it really has not changed in 150 years. That was the FBI's investigative publicity chief, Chris Allen. Um, the old 
wanted posters. It would be nailed to a tree in uh, the center of town. Uh, it's the same basic format. It says wanted at the top and it's got the charges. What did the person do? It's got her a photo. Um, if there's a reward, it says what the reward is, who to contact with information. Um, so the format of a wanted poster um, is pretty static. It, it hasn't changed. What has changed is where where you find that information. Alan is pointing out that where the public is, you'll find the top 10 list. We'll be talking about the modern day top 10 in just a minute. But first, the 10 most wanted fugitives list historically has reflected the concerns of the time. If you think about it, the people the FBI is searching for are the ones who commit the crimes that the Bureau is investigating. It mirrors how the FBI's responsibilities change over time. As new things emerge, and as the nature of what the FBI does changes, so too does the 10 most wanted list. So in the 1950s, you know, it was bank robberies and violent crimes. And of course, a lot of those bank robberies were such. Getting into the 60s, it's starting to be moving more towards things like the assassination of political leaders like Dr. King and the, the uh, domestic terrorist bombings of, you know, the Sterling Hall editions. And into the 1980s, we begin looking at more um, international related crimes. So drug enterprise operations and and things like that. In the 90s, we start adding actual foreign terrorists. You know, bin Laden is added then. Over the past two decades, top 10 lists have focused on threats such as child predators, human traffickers, violent gang activities, and shootings in public places. Really, there's, there's often, if not almost always, that connection with violent crime, certainly with, with the, the heinousness of the, the crimes that, that the folks are wanted for. And again, the, that idea that we want the public helping us, because if we don't get good information from the public, we can't do our jobs. When talking about wanted criminals, the phrase public enemy number one can often come to mind. Whether it was popularized by law enforcement officials or the media, the Bureau would adopt the term from time to time in its past as a catchy way to grab the public's attention. However, when it comes to the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives list, there is no public enemy number one and no ranking from the most dangerous to the least. Investigative publicity is all about putting information and photographs in front of as many people as possible. Whether that involves wanted fugitives, missing children, bank robbers, unknown subjects, or international terrorists, to be successful the FBI has to go where the public is present. One of the foremost ways we do that is through television. Surely all of us have seen at some point or another a crime-related show on TV while flipping through channels. You intend to watch for a little bit, but the intriguing nature of the case just pulls you in. America's Most Wanted, the hugely successful show hosted by John Walsh, was a prime example that assisted the FBI over the years. Uh, its very first episode captured a top tenor, uh, David James Roberts. Um, and in the, the entire run of the program, 17 10 Most Wanted Fugitives were captured as a direct result of tips aired on the program. Um, currently, television shows including In Pursuit and Live PD Wanted air FBI fugitives on their shows. 70 years on, the Most Wanted Fugitives program continues to combine different ways of outreach on a criminal subject on a national level. Wanted posters, newspaper stories, radio shows, and TV programs have been supplemented by new outreach methods as the media landscape has changed. Both Dr. Fox and Allen have seen these changes firsthand. And we're using other means, too. I mean, of course, we put these up on the Internet. We caught our first and most wanted fugitive from an Internet-based tip in, what, 1996? Right. So I said that we go where the public goes or the public's on social media. So so are we. So we use platforms like uh, Twitter, Facebook and Instagram to put out information about fugitives directly into the hands of the public. Um, and then the information on all, on those sites all go, as John said, all go back to the FBI website uh, where we've captured three top tenors as a direct result of people viewing the poster on our website. The FBI also uses billboards as another way of reaching out to the public, this time in their cars as they travel to work or run errands or enjoy a road trip. 
The billboard program began in 2007 as a partnership with an outdoor advertising executive who attended an FBI Citizens Academy. Out of that relationship came the idea of putting FBI fugitives on digital billboards as a public service, and it was immediately successful. 57 fugitives have been captured as a direct result of people seeing an FBI billboard. The program today involves a number of companies across the country. Also want to talk about uh, mobile applications. So this is another way that we're we're getting the information out and this way we're we're putting uh information about fugitives or other wanted cases uh directly in someone's pocket, right? So in 2017, the FBI launched a wanted mobile app that allows the public to search, sort, filter and bookmark the full range of inf- information uh issued by the FBI including f- fugitive uh photographs and information descriptions. So it, it, that's another example of, of just taking the information and putting it wherever uh, the public can easily find it. Across seven decades, 523 fugitives have been placed on the 10 Most Wanted Fugitives list, with 488 of them having been caught as of this broadcast. As a testament to the effectiveness of the Most Wanted program and its outreach, 162 of those captures were made with the public's direct help. Adding a fugitive to the list is an interesting process, especially the criteria that is used to single them out. Alan has seen this process at work many, many times. When there's an opening on the list, when someone gets captured uh, or located, uh, the FBI will canvas all 56 field offices for submissions to the list. Those nominations that come in will be reviewed both by the Criminal Investigative Division and by the Office of Public Affairs. And um, from there, um, a a couple nominations will go up to FBI Executive Management for selection. In order, there's sort of two main criteria uh, that we that we use to to sort through the nominations. The first one is a fugitive has to be considered a particularly dangerous menace to society. And that can be determined in a couple ways. One, if you have a lengthy, uh, consistent criminal record, that's one way of establishing that. Also, if uh, if, if, if the crime you're wanted for is particularly violent or done in a very public setting, that also sort of qualifies as menace to society. The second criteria would be publicity. So this is a publicity program. At its very heart, it's a publicity program. So we have to have a reasonable belief that the publicity afforded by being on the list could aid in the location and capture of the fugitive. Out of the 488 top 10 fugitives that have been captured, 54 of them have been arrested outside the United States. A fugitive's location anywhere in the world is not a deterrent. If they are a dangerous menace to society, and the FBI believes that publicity will assist in their capture, they will be added to the top 10 list. The Bureau will look for them wherever they are. On occasion, even extradition will come into play. When we have a fugitive who is found overseas, The FBI, of course, has to work with the law enforcement from the country where that person is found to get them arrested and then through that country's laws, get them returned to the United States to face criminal justice here. Contrary to what one might think, spies have not appeared on the top 10 list in the past as their inherently clandestine nature negates the publicity-related criteria of the list. Scores of other types of fugitives have appeared on the 10 Most Wanted list, however, from violent criminals to domestic terrorists, even to international terrorists. Overall, the list represents the wide range of what the FBI investigates. The 10 Most Wanted Fugitives list has had a great deal of interesting cases in its illustrious 70-year past. Most have involved violent crime although cyber fugitives and persons wanted for crimes against children, drugs, and white-collar crimes have been added as well. A select few have even shook the foundations of modern American history. The longest period of time in which someone has been on the top 10 list is 32 years. That fugitive was Victor Manuel Herrera, who was added in May of 1984 and removed in December 2016. The fugitive with the shortest amount of time on the top 10 was Billy Austin Bryant, was captured on January 8, 1969 by Washington, D.C. police, just two hours after being placed on the list. Bryant was wanted for the brutal shooting of two FBI agents while evading capture earlier that day. 
postings to the 10 most wanted fugitives list come with a reward. At, at a minimum, the FBI offers up to $100,000 for information on 10 most wanted fugitives. In some instances, that reward is uh, significantly more than that. The highest reward uh, we've seen is for uh, Osama bin Laden, which was $25 million. And he had actually gotten on the list before the September 11th attacks. He was put on for his uh, masterminding the uh, embassy bombings of our U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania in uh, 1998. Besides Osama bin Laden, a number of recognizable names have crossed the 10 most wanted fugitives list over the decades. Serial killer Ted Bundy, Eric Rudolph, the Olympic Park bomber, Andrew Cunanan, the serial killer and killer of uh, Johnny Versace, James Earl Ray, uh, who actually bears the distinction of being on the list twice, first for the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and second, uh, for a short-lived prison escape. And he was someone we actually, we put out a wanted poster of him under a name that he had been using because we hadn't identified his actual identity. But as soon as we did, we put out that name and, of course, his, his um, addition to the top 10 list. And it turns out we caught him overseas. Today's top 10 list is replete with nefarious actors that mirror the alleged heinous and egregious crimes of the fugitives who came before them. Eugene Palmer is the oldest fugitive we've ever put on the list. Uh, He brutally murdered his daughter-in-law in in Stony Point, New York, um, outside of uh, her school. In Arnaldo Jimenez and Badresh Kumar Patel, both murdered their wives. And Rafael Caro Quintero um, is wanted for the kidnapping, torture, and uh, murder of a DEA agent in Mexico. In rare cases, the top 10 list can actually become a top 11, or even higher. These situations involve what's called a special edition. That's addition with an A. If the Bureau has a particularly dangerous individual that we need to catch, and there's not an opening on the top 10, the list is expanded to include them. James Earl Ray was a special edition to the list in 1968 for the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. Ramzi Youssef also was a special edition following the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. The very first of these additions to the list was Richard Lawrence Marquette, who was wanted for murder. At one point, a couple of years later, we actually added four people as special editions right at the same time because they were all wanted for the uh, bombing of a, a research facility at the University of Wisconsin, uh, Sterling Hall. It was an Army Army mathematics research lab and uh, had led to the, the death of uh, uh, one of the postgrad students there. At its heart, the 10 Most Wanted Fugitives program is a publicity program seeking the public's assistance to locate and capture the most dangerous fugitives and reflecting the most prominent crimes of the past seven decades. It is a nationally driven effort, same as it was back in 1950. And it's been a remarkably successful program, a fact that Alan and Dr. Fox, as well as everyone at the FBI, are especially proud of. In the 70 years, we've had 523 fugitives um, on the list. 488 of those were apprehended or located. And of those, 162 were as a direct result of uh, citizen cooperation. So somebody seeing a poster uh, at a post office or on on the website or in, in a newspaper and calling us and, and helping us find it. 162, that's about a third of the cases uh, as a direct result of citizen cooperation. So there's a lot of opportunity out there for the public to, to help us. And so we'd, we'd ask them to go to our website, look on their uh, mobile applications. We've, we've even had two, two of them identified from people who were on the FBI tour and saw the posters up on the wall and said, that looks really familiar. Something to keep in mind is that the FBI is not only looking for the 10 fugitives on the top 10 list. So also uh, on our website, we had the most wanted terrorists list. So here's the top 10 or the 10 most wanted fugitives. We also had the most wanted terrorists list, um, which was the, the genesis of that list was, was 9-11. So right after 9-11, we added 22 mm-hmm. terrorists to that list. That list has, uh, has grown over time. Uh, there's not a set number to that as there is on the, the top 10. Through our website and social media platforms, as well as the Wanted app and digital billboards, we get fugitive information into people's hands, effectively helping us fight crime and reminding the criminals who commit them that the FBI never forgets. 
Don't forget the ways you can help the FBI capture these fugitives. Visit fbi.gov wanted, download our Wanted app, and follow us on social media. And remember, the fugitives on this list are dangerous. If you come across one, contact the FBI at 1-800-CALL-FBI or online at tips.fbi.gov. This has been Eric DeRazio with Inside the FBI. Keep us on your dial, and we'll keep you informed.